We are living in such tumultuous, difficult, challenging times. I'm asking our speakers to please share with us, all of us, three practical tips on how you can strengthen your amuna to build and to fortify genuine faith in Hashem and the Almighty. I think one very important method to strengthen your amuna is the mental space and the energy and the time that you dedicate to prayer, to davening, and to meditation. Every single day, we owe it to ourselves, to our souls, and to our lives, and to all of our loved ones, to carve out time in the day. And not just time on the clock, but time in our soul. When we're really dedicated to cultivating our relationship with our Creator, our relationship with the essence of our soul, with the essence of our reality. There's a beautiful interpretation in the Zohar on a verse in Isaiah, Nafshi Ivisicha Balaila, my soul, I crave you at night. And the Zohar says that this is the human being talking to Hashem, to God, and saying, You're my soul, you're the essence of consciousness, you're the essence of reality, hence I crave you. We are in a relationship with God. Each of us has a Muna. A Muna is the essential nature of every soul and every human being because we're part of the divine. You are divine. But we need to carve out time in our day to be able to focus, to be able to tune in, to be able to enter into the world of silence, the world that transcends the static and the distractions internally and externally. So make that time every day for prayer, for meditation, for internal connection. That's number one. Well, first and foremost, I would, I would suggest number one, I would say, and I heard this from a great, great friend of mine. He said that don't be scared to ask questions. Ask questions, investigate. The Mishnah says in Pirkei Avos, Da ma shetoshuv l'apikores. Know what to answer to a heretic, to someone who, who's anti, who doesn't, who's against this stuff. What, is, what does that mean? I don't know any heretics. Says someone by the name of Rabbi Miller, Rabbi Victor Miller used to say, the Mishnah is talking about you. Know what to answer to your own heresy, to your own questions. Don't shy away. Don't sweep it under the rug. If you have a question, ask it, look into it, investigate. That, I would say, is number one. I'll tell you something very interesting. We know that in the mezuzah itself, the parsha of Shema Yisrael is in the mezuzah. The Shema Yisrael is one of the most important parts of the Torah and certainly one of the most meaningful expressions of tefillah that we have. And I'll tell you something very interesting. Rav Schwab has a wonderful sefer on tefillah. It's called Rav Schwab on Prayer. I recommend it to everyone. And in there he quotes a Zohar Chodosh in Rus that says like this, Asvosa Labarnash, the remedy, the strength of a person in this world, Bechol Yayma Man Dekara Kriyashma Altikuna, the one who reads Kriyashma the way it's supposed to be read. I'll show you something very interesting that Rav Schwab says. Never realized this. Shema Yisrael has six words. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Malikeinu, Hashem Echad. Baruch Sheim has six words. Baruch Sheim Kavoyed Malchus Eliyalom Vo'ed, six words. Why six words? Rav Schwab says something fascinating. We know that there are six Arei Miklot, six cities of sanctuary, three in Eretz Yisrael, three in Eber Yardin. The words of Shema Yisrael are our cities of sanctuary. That can give us chizok. That can show us our closeness to Hashem, and I'll tell you why. This is how I think that we should all be reading Shema Yisrael, this sentence, and you will see it will bring us to Emunah. You see, there are many different names that Hashem has, and every name represents a different characteristic of Hashem. The word Yudke Vovke Hashem represents the Midas Sachesed, the Midah of compassion, Rachamim. Eloikeinu, or Eloikim, represents the Midas Hadin, judgment. So now listen to how I think that we should say Shema Yisrael every day, and that will give us faith. Shema Yisrael, Kla Yisrael, listen, Hashem, Hashem, Hashem has given us so much good, so much chesed. If you think about all the chesed Hashem has done for you all your life, all the compassion that He has had on you, 
and then Elikeinu. There is judgment. We've been going through very difficult times these last two and a half years, whether it's COVID, Ukrainian Jews, Maron, Surfside, many, many problems. That's a lacano. But the Gemara Psachim tells us at the end of time, we just have to hang in there. Hashem, and we're going to understand why everything was really Hashem's chesed, Hashem's compassion. We can't understand it now. But when we say Shema, we're fortif fortifying our emuna. Because we're saying, we know Hashem, you've done so much good for all of us. And then there's a lakeno, there's mishpat, but we have trust and faith that Hashem echad. That's one way I think that we can strengthen our amuna. The first is to get a mentor, a Rebbe or a Rebbetzin in your life. I know that for me personally, the turning point in my life was when I met my Rebbe, Rav Pam Zatzal. And I saw his purity, his genuineness, his respect for humanity, his kindness. It helped me build my faith, my Amuna. The second thing is, it's important to be able to study texts, svarim, books of Torah, that cultivate, that strengthen, that help us access that which is inside of us. So find those works and those teachers and those classes that inspire you that ignite the fire in your eyes and ignite the fire in your soul and spend time studying it. It's like any discipline, any trade, any profession, anything in the world, you can't become good at it just from one message. Whether it's music or sports, whether it's exercise or dancing, whether it's writing or communication, they say you need 10,000 hours of practice in order to perfect it. The word emuna means faith, but the word emuna also comes from the word umnus, which is something that requires constant nurturing, exercise. In Hebrew, it's called the imunim. You have to exercise the muscle of faith. How do you exercise it? First thing is through prayer and meditation. The second thing is through study and learning those works, those books, and from those teachers that will strengthen and help you access your amuna. Number two, there are wonderful books out there. I'll give one a shout out. I don't make any money off this, but there's a book called Living Amuna. Living Amuna just goes through story after story with beautiful ideas to give us an insight into the amazing world that we live in and to how much Hashem does for us all the time. Read about these stories. And when somebody reads about them, the more we read about them, the more it enters into us. I'll tell you something great that I heard from Rabbi Malach Biederman, famous speaker in Eretz Yisrael. He said, every morning a person has a coffee, right? So he said, take a look at this. You have a coffee, right? Coffee is bitter. What do you do? You put sugar in it. Sugar is sweet. You take hot water, and then you put cold milk in it. So look what you've gotten in that cup of coffee. You've got bitter and sweet, hot and cold. And what do you say on it? Shah coil. Yeah, bit far right. Everything isn't only because God wants it to exist. And that cup of coffee, look at that cup of coffee. It shows us that everything that's going to happen that day, from that cup of coffee and on, it's only because Hashem wants it to happen. You drink that cup of coffee and think about it. Everything that's going to happen that day, the bitter, the sweet, the hot, the cold, it's all only because Hashem wants it to happen. That's another way that I believe that we can strengthen our Amuna. Second of all, the most neglected subject perhaps in yeshivas today is the study of Chumash. We got to learn Chumash. Chumash is a blueprint for life. Istakil Baraisa Uvar Alma, the Rabbanisham God Almighty, he looked into the Torah, Baraisa, and he created the world. If you want to know God, if you want to believe in God, if you want to feel God, Internally, we have to learn Chumash. We have to get introduced to who Avraham was, Abraham, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, in a very deep way, Moshe Rabbeinu. I think that if we learn Chumash, it will strengthen our Amunah. The third thing I would say is, dedicate every day, even a few minutes, to help somebody. Because Every single person is carved out in the image of Hashem. And every single soul is a piece of Hashem. 
And when I can ignite the light in another person, that light comes back to me. And that too strengthens a person's amuna. And I think maybe number three we could say is to actually speak about it. Speak about ideas. Ish tefim a person goes after what they praise. When we talk about how much Hashem has done for us and we focus and we look into that and we discuss it, that has a big impact on who we actually are. So number one, don't be scared of the questions. Investigate. Number two, read up about wonderful ideas and stories of people that have been through experiences that bring out the amuna of what Hashem has done for us. And number three is to actually talk about it yourself. One of the exercises that I learned many years ago that I like to do with my kids on Shabbos is, so what happened to you this week? Did anything happen to you this week that you could share that was something where you saw Hashem in your life? Speak about the ideas has a major impact. That would be essay number three. Now, the Pasuk says like this, Morabu Masecha Hashem, how wonderful and how great are your deeds. Kulam B'chachma Asisa, you've made all of them with such wonder and wisdom. Mola Ha'oretz Kinyo Necha, the earth is filled with your possessions. Well, the Kutzka Rebbe said something so interesting, but Derech Drush, homiletically, and he says like this, the word Kinyo Necha means to acquire you. Mola Ha'oretz, if we look throughout the whole world, Kinyo Necha, we can acquire your, your love for us and our understanding of you, what you're all about. Because we can be kinder and realize that Hashem is in our lives. How? When we look at all the great things that Hashem has made. Now there's a Pesach in Yeshaya that says like this, Yeshaya Mem Pesach Chavav, Se'u Moroim Eneichem, lift up your eyes high, Ra'u and see, Mi Bora Eile, who created these? Think about it, the trees, the clouds, of course, Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, whether you're traveling in Vermont or in the Rockies or in Cape Town, as I've had the discourse to travel. Fabulous. All these places are amazing. Look out and see, go to Switzerland. You'll see the beauty. And you'll see who created all this. You want to have a Muna, you want to have faith. You'll see, that's where it's all about. You see the beauty of the world. And you know something? The Radak says something so interesting. On this Pasek Su'u Marai Menechem, he says, Ki yesh la'odom lo'hoven b'darkei ha'chochma. A person has to think of the wisdom of how Hashem created the world. Even when you say Asher Yotza, think about that. When you say Asher Yotza, you're thanking Hashem for the whole orchestra of the body, the colon, the spleen, the heart, the digestive system, the circulatory system. Stop and think, who made all this? Who made all this? And every day new things are happening. The world renews itself. And if it renews itself, it's got to be a creator that does it. So that's the ways. Those are three ways that I believe that we can come closer to Amuna. First of all, the way we say Shema Yisrael. Second of all, let's think about that cup of coffee and see that everything that happens in the day happens only because of Hashem. And let's look at the godless of the human being and the godless of the world. And thirdly, there's an excellent resource, a book called Strength in Ramuna. It's put out by Feldheim. And we worked very hard on this book. I'm almost willing to guarantee that if you seriously read this book, it will change your life and give you a moon of faith. Now, I'm asking our speakers to please share with us two easy but overlooked things that we can do to bring Mashiach to herald the ultimate redemption. Beautiful question. So, the Rambam, Maimonides, the greatest Jewish philosopher and codifier who lived in the 12th century in Spain, in Morocco, in Israel, and then in Egypt, Rambam, Maimonides, writes in the Laws of Repentance, chapter 3, based on the Talmud and Kedushin, that a person should always look at himself or herself and at the entire world 
as in an equal balance. And if I do one mitzvah in thought or words or actions, I do one positive, divine, sacred deed or word or thought, I have the power to tip the scale, as he says, and change the balance of myself and of the entire world and bring, to quote him, Yeshua v'hatzalala'ilam, salvation to the world. No other religion or faith that I know of has given the human being, the human individual, such dignity and such power that literally every move I, I make, I can tip and see myself as having the ability to tip the scale and bring salvation to the world. Bringing Mashiach, I think this is, this is something that everybody wants, whether they realize it or not, whether it's for the right reasons, for the wrong reasons. I mean, we know how, how, did we, how were we redeemed when we were in Egypt, when we were in Mitzrayim. What, what, what happened? The answer is we called out to Hashem, we davened, we prayed. Lord Almighty, Ribbonu Shel Olam, could you help us, please, save us, get us out of here. Ask for it. Ask for it. But more than just saying the words, let it enter into the heart. Rachman Oliba Ba'i, Hashem wants our heart. So if we were to maybe push ourselves a little, and you take a look, we do it every day, in the Amidah, in the Shemona Esrei, it is chock full of asking Hashem to bring Mashiach, to, to bring the base Hamigdash, so we could have the temple again. Davin, speak to Hashem, but let it be real, not only from the mouth, but straight from the heart. There's a fascinating Gemara in Yavama Samach Beis Oman Aleph, and it tells us like this. Ein ben David Bo, Mashiach is not going to come, at she yichlu kol neshamais sheba guf, until all the neshamais of a place called guf. Now listen what Rashi says. Rashi says that there is a place, an oitzer, a storage house. It's called guf, and every neshama that was ever created starts out in that storage place called Guf. And only when children are born, new people are born, the Neshamas leave that storage house, Guf. Then when they've all left that storage house, that's when Mashiach come. You know what I think that means? We should be ready, Shidduchim. If you're married, that's wonderful. There's so many people out there that need Shidduchim. And especially young people that are gonna be able to have children. You wanna bring Mashiach? It's not going to happen until the neshamais that could be created from couples that get married. So let's read Shidduchim. That's one way of bringing Mashiach closer. We have to smile. We're not smiling enough. The Tanit Velayo says that Isaiah the prophet, Yeshaya Novi, gave the most comforting and sweetest words to the Jewish people more than any other prophet. He says, why? Because Isaiah Yeshaya was a happy person. When you're happy, you get good things. We walk around, particularly a lot of Jewish people, we're glum, we're morose. We're not smiling, we're not happy. We should be euphoric. There's no one that has what we have. We're the most fortunate, privileged, blessed people on the planet. Why are we not jumping for joy? When you smile at someone, when you smile at another person, you put a smile on someone's face, you're putting a smile on God's face. You see, because a person is a reflection of God and at a very deep level, God is a reflection of the person. And God wants us to be joyous. When we're joyous, when we're happy, when we smile at others, it creates a certain type of bliss a movement of happiness that brings the ultimate happiness, the coming of Mashiach. That's number one. Here's another way. The Pasuk tells us in Yeshaya Aleph Chavzayim, Tzion b'mishpah tipoda v'shoveha b'tztaka. Tzion is going to be redeemed when there'll be justice, and v'shoveha, they'll come back b'tztaka when people are giving tztaka. I think we have to be so careful that we all give miser, that we give tzedakah. Teach your children, especially now in the summer, if they're in summer camp or they're babysitting or whatever, they're a counselor, waiter, whatever, and they make some money, make sure that they give a tenth of miser, that's tzedakah. 
And also, every one of us has to be careful that we give stoka. I know people say, oh, don't worry, I give plenty of stoka. No, no, no. Take a cheshman, you'll see. I try to keep it to the penny. And I'll tell you something that Rav Shalom Shradron taught me. Amazing thing. He said, you can even give stock in advance. Now, let's say you make $100. Of course, $100 profit, obviously, without expenses. Because for expenses, you don't have to pay stucker from that money. But if you've made $100 profit, you've got to give 10 But let's say you want to give now 50 because there's an organization that's raising money and you want to give them money. You could give that $40 in advance. And then when you make the other $400, so you don't have to give money because you've given that stucker in advance. And not only that, I'll tell you something from Rav Schwab. It's amazing. He used to do that, but every year at the beginning of the year, he would say, okay, Hashem, I gave, let's say, $500 extra. We're starting a new cheshben. You're giving me a new year of life? I'm giving you a new cheshben of tzedakah. That's incredible. I don't know if any of us are on that madriga, but it's a great madriga. But one thing is for sure, v'shavah, but tzedakah. You want to bring Mashiach? You've got to, go, got to give tzedakah. Another thing I would say is give tzedakah every day. Talmud says tzedakah, charity, hastens redemption. And charity is not just with money. Yes, it's of course with money. But charity is also time. And charity is your soul. And charity is with your heart. But every day, dedicate some time to help another person. Financially, physically, emotionally, psychologically, and spiritually. Another idea, perhaps, which is something that we could work on, to get to the point where we can have Mashiach, where we can be taken care of, is maybe an idea that perhaps you will hear me speak about at length, and that's judging people favorably, creating a sense of unity and actus amongst the Jewish people. It doesn't mean that we agree on everything, but at least we can understand where someone's coming from. And that gives a whole other perspective on what the relationship can actually be and how we can approach someone and actually develop a relationship. We don't have to agree with everything, but we can get along. And maybe if each one of us would take upon ourselves that I'm going to make, my, make sure myself that I'm going to push myself a little bit more just to get closer. To get closer to someone that maybe I'm not so close with. To see their perspective, even if I don't agree with it, but to actually see where they're coming from. Perhaps that can create that unity that will also help us to be able to be ultimately redeemed. My second recommendation to bring Mashiach is to have peace. Don't be in a fight. I know this sounds trite and cliche, but I mean it with all my heart. Don't be involved in machloikas. No fighting. I don't care if it's your sister-in-law, your brother-in-law, your mother-in-law, your father-in-law, your parents, your siblings, your employees, the guy in shul, your neighbor. Whatever it is, make a pledge, a commitment today that I will not be involved, no matter what, I will not be involved in a fight. Why? I want to give you an example. The largest yeshiva in the entire world on planet Earth today is none other than the Mir Yeshiva in Jerusalem in Eretz Yisrael in Israel. Almost 10,000 students. Why would they zoicha? Why did they merit? Why were they blessed to be the largest? Nothing is coincidental. Nothing is what we call, you know, serendipity. Why the Mir? Why not the Yeshiva? Well, there's another thing about the Mir. The Mir Yeshiva is the only Yeshiva in the world that escaped, that emerged from the Holocaust totally intact, unscathed, impervious to the war. All of the yeshivas, casualties, fatalities, broken up. Why? I once heard that the Mir had many family members involved, what we call nepotism. Blazer Yudel Finkel, who was a Rosh Hashiva that brought the Mir from World War II, from the Holocaust, the post-World War II era, to Eretz Yisrael, to the land of Israel, he made sure to keep peace amongst everyone. He said, Amai Yeshiva, amongst his family, there will be no fighting, nothing. And where there's peace, there is blessing. God, Hashem, saw this, and he said, I'm going to reward this Yeshiva. They're going to get out of the Holocaust. But not only that, they will become the largest yeshiva, perhaps in the history, the largest yeshiva. Because they would not allow machlokas fighting.
Don't allow fighting. If families can maintain peace, if communities could avoid breakups, I think we could help bring the Mashiach so much closer. If there's one critical thing that should be on the agenda of every single Jew, regardless of background or geography, what would it be? Let's hear from our speakers. To be able to empower ourselves and all of our people, all of our brothers and sisters the world over, to rise up to the calling of history, to be able to become that nation, that people, which we were conceived to become. In the words of the prophet Isaiah, er I have made you a light unto the nations, to become a people, mamlechet kohanim v'go kadosh, a kingdom of princes and a holy nation, to ignite the fire in each and every single one of us, to be able to maximize our potentials and to realize who we are, chosen by the creator of the world, to light up the planet, to elevate humanity, to transform the landscape of planet Earth, to make it a world of goodness, kindness, love, compassion, and morality, an abode for the divine. To every, understand that every single one of us, individually and collectively, is an ambassador of the divine in this world, an ambassador of love, light, hope, wisdom, morality, authenticity, and redemption. As a people and as individuals, we should not stutter. We should not duck in fear. We should not surrender to mediocrity and live lives of quiet desperation. Rather, each and every single one of us, individually and collectively, should be able to rise to our historical mission to become a voice and a messenger for truth, for compassion, for wisdom, for love, and for redemption. What has to be on everybody's mind? Man, woman, and child, religious, secular, it doesn't make a difference. Every one of us has to have in our mind. What's the point? Where are we headed? Dare I call this a seventh inning stretch. Where'd you come from? Where you go? Where'd you come from? Katna Joe. Where do we come from? Where are we? And where are we going? What's the purpose of my existence? Am I trying to figure it out? And once I do, what steps must I take in order to accomplish that goal? That, my friends, in a nutshell, sums up a beautiful book called The Mesilas Sisharm, The Path of the Just. Highly recommend it. It was written recently, 250 years ago, whatever. But I highly recommend looking at this to go and to figure out, we have to be thinking, what are we doing here? What's this all about? What's the end game? And once somebody has clarity in the end game, now we can start the process of making our way towards there. I'll tell you a great story. I have a dear friend, his name is Rabbi Rafal Mendelowitz from Silver Spring, Maryland. He has a very unusual type of summer camp. It's a travel camp. The name of the camp is Morabu, and it's based on the Pasik in Tehillim Kufdalid, Pasik Chavdalid. Morabu Masech, how great are your works, Hashem. And so what he does is he takes a whole group of yeshiva boys in the middle of the summer, and they go basically to three places. They go to the Grand Canyon in Arizona, they go to the geysers in Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming, and they go to Bryce National Park in Utah. Beautiful places. Every night they're in some lodge, they rent a hotel for the boys, and some nights they're able to camp out. Now, he told me that this past summer, something very unusual happened. They were into the trip five, six days, and one night, a boy who had never been in the camp before, a very fine boy from New Jersey, this boy came in and he had tears in his eyes. And Rabbi Mendelowitz asked, is everything okay? And the boy said, Rebbe, 
we've been on this trip six days already, and not once was I able to kiss a mezuzah. Could you imagine? What a holy child. The child, of course, every night, either they were out camping in tents, or else they were in lodges or motels, whatever they rented. But of course, in those places, there was no mezuzah. Now, he has had this camp for close to 20 years. No one ever said that before. This is a very sensitive boy. And that's the agenda. That's what I would think that every person should make a connection to, religious or not religious. You have a mezuzah on your doorpost. You have a mezuzah in your living room, your dining room, your bedroom, wherever it is. Touch it. Kiss it. Make a connection to Hashem. We have such an opportunity so many times during the day. And do we think about it? This young man, he thought about it, right? But sometimes we just walk out of the house. I would never, ever go to sleep at night without kissing the mezuzah on the bedroom door post. Always. And you know something? On the outside of the mezuzah, it always has a shin. Why? Because that represents the name Shin Dalad Yud, we pronounce it Shakai. But also, the Shin Dalad Yud stands for Shemer Dalsois Yisrael. Hashem protects the doors and the homes of Klal Yisrael. And there's a very interesting medrash that tells a story about Unculus. And the story is not for now, but basically the principle that he brought out was that normally you would have somebody living in the inside of his home and the guards are watching from the outside. But here it's just the opposite. We're inside the home and Hashem is watching us. Hashem is watching us. He's protecting us. And that's why every person, religious or not religious, touch the mezuzah a few times a day. Kiss it. Kiss your hand that is touching that mezuzah. And that way you make a connection to Hashem every single day. I'll tell you what I think has to be front and center on the agenda and the hearts and minds and the soul of every Jew on this planet, no matter their backgrounds, no matter their affiliation, no matter where they live. And that is the Holocaust. I'm not talking about never again. I want you to understand something about the Holocaust that most people are just not familiar with and they don't fathom, they don't conceive. The Holocaust wasn't perpetrated by Neanderthals, by cavemen by people from the Dark Ages or medieval times. The Holocaust was committed by the most sophisticated elite intellectual society ever in the history of mankind. More Nobel Prize winners came out of Germany pre-World War II than any other country on earth. The Holocaust was from the country that produced Schopenhauer, Hegel, Kant, Nietzsche, the greatest philosophers ever. How? Look at the notorious Nazis. Goebbels, Himmler, Hitler, Rosenberg. Social Darwinists. Pagans. Amoral. In Germany, they lost morality. There was no God. Yeah, it was predicated on Lutheranism. But in the 20th century, they innovated, they pioneered their own morality. And why should that speak to us? Because you look at America today, you say, well, the Holocaust can never be repeated. Oh, really? 60 million abortions in the land of the free and the home of the brave. Do you know what's on Biden's agenda more than perhaps anything else right now? Because of his Deputy Secretary of Health, Secretary Levine, tragically a Jewish woman man, he, she. The idea that children should be able to choose their genders and engage in special gender reassignment surgery, even though the FDA is saying it's dangerous. They say, no, no, this is a medical necessity. It's critical that a child should be able to say, well, it's America. We've lost our minds. When we lose our minds, when there's no morality, anything could happen. 
The Holocaust could, God forbid, come yet again without Jews asserting themselves as the moral beacons and standing up and stepping to the plate and saying we have to reintroduce Judeo-Christian ethics. We have to be proud Torah-observant Jews and bring morality back to society, to the masses. Why were the Jews victims? Six million Jews. The Holocaust was nothing novel. The Holocaust happened on a smaller scale throughout the millennia. You had the pogroms and the crusades and the inquisitions. Jews were always being butchered and annihilated. But in the 20th century, after the Industrial Revolution, now it was automated where you could kill 10,000 Jews in one day. You see, if we Jews coalesce, if we unify, and we stick together, and we don't point fingers, and we don't act vindictive, and we don't stereotype and stigmatize and say, I'm better than you, then we are a united front. Hashem promises us that you will be immune to the big bad wolf. Remember, there are 70 wolves looking to attack the one little sheep. The anomaly is not the Holocaust. Because a little sheep should always be attacked. The anomaly is when we're not attacked. Because Hashem says, when you stand together, I give you a halo. I give you a protection. You're indomitable. You're invincible. You're untouchable. And that's what we're going to work on this Tisha above. We're going to stand united. We're going to say, I love my fellow Jew. I care deeply. I will never put down another Jew. I will not allow another Holocaust. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed this presentation. I would like to ask all of you, please, if you haven't done so already, please make a very gracious donation to BJX. It is a wonderful organization that inspires Jews, our brothers and sisters, throughout the world.